Ernst Gombrich, the uh, art historian, said that there really is no such thing as art, only artists. So welcome to a new series on Radio 4 called Only Artists. And I'm here in North London to meet Naomi Alderman, playwright, author, and most interestingly, writer of computer games. Because I'm interested in the border between high and low culture, and also I'm kind of mystified by computer games. So I'm hoping she's going to convince me otherwise that they are deserving of being called art. The Turner Prize winning ceramicist and wreath lecturer Grayson Perry meets the author and computer games creator Naomi Alderman. Naomi's first novel, Disobedience, is currently being made into a feature film starring Rachel Weisz. Her latest, The Power, is shortlisted for this year's Orwell Prize and is being adapted for television. Hello. Hello, Naomi. Hello, I'm Grace and Perry. <laughs> it's lovely to meet you. Um, I've got a bicycle. What should I do with you it? You should bring it in here. My flat is a tip. Oh, that's all right. Yes. I, I, you know. I Naomi, this is where you do your writing. And the room's kind of packed with what I, what I might call analogue culture. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true, because because digital culture does not destroy analogue culture, in my view. Uh, so telly did not destroy the theatre. And I like books and I like video games. And I know that this is often a surprise to people. Um, I remember somebody asked me once saying, oh, but, you know, are gamers interested in the news. And I thought, well, who do you think that you think gamers are? Gamers are just people. The games is now the most lucrative, most financially dominant entertainment industry in the world. It passed by movies in 2011. Games are still growing by someone between 10 and 20% a year, which is the sort of figure that the music and film industries would kill for. Basically, if you're not a game player, they would like to find a game that you might like to play. Well, th that's a great point to start our conversation, actually, because I am probably their ultimate target audience because I've never been attracted to it. At, I, my only flirtation with computer games was because I've always loved motorcycling and, and, and sort of racing and things like that. I got into Gran Turismo mm. for a while, but I, I found it a very poor reproduction of real life, and so I gave up on it. And also the kind of fiddliness of it really aggravated me. Yeah, this is often the thing, that a lot of art forms start off by trying to imitate real life precisely, and then when they get a bit more confident, they start to be able to do things that are more, let's say, medium-specific, if we're talking about art. So there definitely are games that are just trying to reproduce, let's see what it's like to drive a car somewhere. Uh, but the ones that I'm more interested in are the ones that take advantage of the things that the medium can do that you can't do anywhere else. So um, there's everything from... I'm, I want to show you a bunch of stuff, okay. if I may. Yes. <laughs> I think we need to transition at this point. <laughs> we might. Yes, you've got quite an array of technology. You've I got a projector, got, you've yes. got consoles, you've got all sorts I've, of consoles. I've got everything, I've got everything. This is my job. So you, you, you are literally talking to a games virgin, pretty much. The futility of it, I think, might be the echoing somewhere in my unconscious. It's like, when I lie on my deathbed, I do not want to say, oh, I wish I'd played more computer games. <laughs> OK, but suppose that your work were not creative work. Suppose that your work involved, I don't know, talking for hours to the public. Mm. Like you were in one of those jobs, one of those sort of receptionist jobs or call centre jobs where you're all day you're talking to members of the public who maybe are um, not happy to hear from you or, you know, the public. We are often irascible. So you want to and... come home and shoot the public? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or like you want to come home and maybe do something that is active. Because, you know, you haven't used up that energy in your day of, like... Well, maybe, physically active, you mean? Maybe like physically those, like, active, or maybe... Or yeah, something. maybe a dancing game, or maybe like, an exploring game. Maybe a game where there's an enormous open world, and the more of it you explore and uncover, the more of it there is to see. And so you get that feeling of, like, adventure 
in a day where you, may, you might be an adventurous person, you might spend your weekends rock climbing, but mm. you know, actually after a day sitting at your desk talking to yet another boring client, you might say, oh, yes, I'd love to play a game in which I explore an imaginary East Asian country where I can climb over the mountains in this game. You know, there are a lot of months of the year where it's actually quite hard to get out and do exciting things between the hours of yeah, 7 o'clock and that. midnight. But I also have a suspicion that there's a large department of games designers, all done neuroscience at university, and they know exactly what rewards to give you when you push those buttons. I think that is true. In order for you to become addicted to those games, to that constant little sort of, you know, those little pecks of reward that they give you. I think that is true. I think you have to be, you know, some games designers are in good faith and some games designers are in bad faith. You know, the same thing is true with supermarkets and the same thing is true with a lot of websites that, you know, want you, you, I don't know if you've ever had... are not trying to call themselves high culture. <laughs> but I don't think those games are high culture. <laughs> this, is, this is where I would make my distinction between... I would make, and in fact, I, I don't really care about high culture, low culture anyway, but I would make my decision, distinction between games that are in good faith, where they are giving you a really fantastic experience, and the reason that you want to keep coming back is because it's so good, and games that are just sort of using the little prod, 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 all of those little tricks, and they always feel hollow. Here's a level. Do you like level up, complete your thing? Now you're 20% of the way to the next one. Carry on. Those mechanics could be used to basically motivate you to do anything, Mm. at which point you go, oh, well, this is not coming into contact with the deepest and most important parts of myself. I've just realised that I'm being quite disingenuous by saying I am a games virgin because when Charlie Brooker did his countdown of the best games ever, Mm -hmm. number one, of course, was Twitter. (laughs) Yes, yes. If we were to put those two things next to each other... I would say there is probably not a video game in the world that is as pernicious as social media. And, like, I've enjoyed social media, but you have to be very careful about how you use it. But it's a game often, it's, you know, yeah. because you get scores. You, you know, get there scores. you've got those little mm-hmm. likes and retweets, mm-hmm. and people become obsessed, and, and, you know, and people on Instagram are constantly kind of trying to mould their life almost yeah. to, so that it gets higher scores. And in a way, it's doing what I kind of hoped games would be able to do but also it's quite frightening yeah yeah and you can easily get sucked into it i mean i would say to you capitalism is a game in that sense you have a score Mm -hmm. you know what score you've achieved you can compare your score to other people's scores you're supposed to try and get more points that is how you're supposed to apparently spend your life get more points use the points to get more items use the items to leverage your ability to get more points so we've got that the the point score idea of 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 value in life Mm -hmm. But then, of course, the high cultural um, champions would always say there's another set of values that they are... And and the good games Mm -hmm. and the good operas and the good lifestyles, they're all kind of putting forward a different set of values. And maybe, this is always the question, can you do that within the capitalist system? Like, can you sell me something that is outside the point system? Can you sell me something that encourages me to live outside the point system in some way? Martin Luther might have something to say about this. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and some people would say, no, you absolutely can't. Once Once you're selling something, you're already part of the system, you're corrupt, whatever. I would say this is the system that we have, and I'm going to try and work within it to talk about some things that I think are probably more meaningful than how much money you have or... You know, whether you're going to level up until your next level are there of the any game. religious games where you yeah. kind of score points for heaven? There are a few religious games. There are a f- Well, yeah, I want to show you one, actually. OK, that would yeah, be interesting for this out. game sceptic. For this game sceptic, <laughs> climb up on here. So this is what I would call a religious game. It's called Journey. Right. This game is deliberately designed to be fairly easy to get to grips with the controls of often when you play it you are doing co-play with a stranger that is there's somebody else in the world and that's not someone that you know it's just that it's been allotted to you randomly right such that that stranger can only help you or ignore you oh they can't fight you they can't fight you okay so it's quite idealistic yeah it's a game with goodwill. Yes, it is. Yes, yes, I like that. I like the idea. Yes. 
Shall we sit down? Still got to hold. I've never actually held a games controller in okay. my hand before. All though. right. Welcome. <laughs> Everything's going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, women have played fewer games than men. And uh, probably that's because games have been quite lengthy and somewhat compulsive experiences. And women will say to themselves, well, I just don't have the time. Uh, so my friend who's a games consultant says to games companies, how do you get women to play your game? Tell them it'll only take 20 minutes. Actually, a lot of people don't have 40 hours to play. And I think that's totally reasonable. However, there is the burgeoning and exciting field of indie games, independent games, which are games made by small studios, often with a sort of interesting, quirky, creative vision which tend to be much more of a two- or three-hour experience to a 40- or 60-hour experience. So I suppose those are the ones that I specifically do you think, love. Do you think Wagner had these kind of conversations? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. You know, do you think I could get away with a five-and-a-half-hour opera here? You know? <laughs> but people don't want to make the commitment to this, you know. <laughs> it's interesting, right? It's like, cause, because art you can take in at a glance, but probably an artist wouldn't want the audience to do that. Well, I don't know. I, mean, I think one of the great assets of visual art, the kind of stuff that I make, is that you kind of get it or you don't sometimes in an instant. Mm. And also you can drink and talk while you're enjoying it, which is like, you know, completely <laughs> one of the greatest assets of visual art. Like of all the art forms, I, I find theatre the most taxing. Like brilliant theatre is brilliant, but terrible theatre, you're sitting there far away from your home in an uncomfortable seat whilst watching people emoting on a stage yes. and you're not enjoying it. And if you try to leave at any point, you'll be pushing past other people. And there's no zoom. You can't zoom <laughs> in on their faces and see the emotions. They're like little stick figures that are shouting at you, you know, and it's like... I think a lot of people feel that way about theatre, and I don't think either of us would say, oh, that's because theatre is bad. Excellent theatre is excellent, but we feel like it's culturally imposed on us to... If you're going to consider yourself to be a truly cultured person, then you should occasionally go to the theatre. Mm. Um, but we don't have that feeling about games yet. Yes, yeah, so this this is in many ways the crux of the conversation that I want to have with you, which is, you know, I come from a generation that is often blamed in a way for kind of, you know, we grew up with subculture, we were punks and we were new romantics and rock rollers, and now we take that very seriously, but we take it just as seriously as, as the, the bits of high culture as well, like theatre and going to art galleries and classical music. Uh, uh, the rebellion is over. You know. I'm a committed anti high culture, low culture divide person. I don't believe that you can tell whether something is good from the genre that it is. I believe you can examine it and say, well, this is a great piece of art. This is a rubbish piece of art. This is a great game. This is a rubbish one. This is a great TV show. And this TV show is poorly put together. But I don't think that there's genres that are specifically high and low culture. So I grew up an Orthodox Jew. And Orthodox Jewish people, one of the foundational ideas of that culture is dividing between things you know these are the things that shall not mix mm. don't mix your milk and your meat don't mix your jewish people and non-jewish people you, on the sabbath you can't carry anything outside the boundary of your house unless you erect an extra boundary these wires people put around it's very boundaries boundaries and having um given up on that i think i'm fundamentally questioning of all boundaries or at least I look at all boundaries and I think probably this is just arbitrary, probably yeah. this is just and made I, up. And I work in a biz, you know, the art biz, which is kind of like almost thrives on its boundary and that if you bring something into the art world, it somehow has to be taken seriously and I often look at the things that are in art galleries and go, no that's just bad television or no that's just bad theatre, you know why? And you can't, I can't take it seriously just because it's in a white cube or where, you know it's at this gallery, you know and I think often a lot of artists use that kind of borrowed import if you like mm. of the context whenever I make something I always want it to compete with the genre so if I make a pot I want it to compete with the history of ceramics mm. if I make a television program I want it to get a BAFTA you know and, and so when I see people who kind of make appallingly unengaging culture under the auspices of seriousness you know it appalls me and I often tell people in the in the kind of high culture biz, just remember people go to art galleries on their day off. <laughs> yes! You have a responsibility to your audience. 
It's <laughs> not work. Just because they work in it and they're very serious and, you know, yes, I'm glad that they're professional at it, doesn't mean the audience wants to sort of feel like they're doing their homework. So we've got a sort of shimmering sand on the screen there. Yeah. Sort of sand dunes. Yeah. And there is a sun and some a mountain and on, to, on, on there are all sorts of things. What would you say they look like? Graves. They look like graves. Lots of things sticking out. There's a star falling to earth. Sorry. Oh look, here's a person. Very non-gendered person in a red robe with orange. A little bit sort of burkery. Yes, a little bit burkery. Okay, why right. don't you take that? Right, so is that the, me? That's you. So oh, on the okay. screen it's showing you that if you do this and this with the... Oh, I see. Then it will turn in different ways. It's not doing it though. And now it do would I have like... To push the, that Yes, one? there we go. Oh, I see. So that will make you walk. Oh, I see. If you so press I... that little stick forward. So, so where would you the, like the, to it, go? The sand is amazing. It's like really kicking up from his little pointy feet. Yeah. Where so, do I want to go? Yeah, well, I don't where, know where I'm well, going. I'm just going over around. the dunes. Yeah, have a look around and see if there's anything that seems like a feature in the landscape that you might want to... Oh, OK. Games are a melding, a meeting of two fields, technology and the arts. And typically, these are fields where if you were a 16-year-old who's interested in technology and science, you have been sat in a separate building to 16-year-olds who are interested in the arts in music and drawing and writing and to my mind this has been one of the problems with games let's say taking themselves seriously as an art form even in that a lot of the people who are making the structures on which these things exist don't really have any knowledge about how to tell the difference between a good piece of writing and a bad piece of writing, a good piece of drawing and a bad piece of drawing. Yeah. And they don't even know that those skills exist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, that that's... Because the, the gatekeepers of culture often are people who have enormous experience, you mm. know, like editors in, in the literary world or curators in the in the art world. You know, they're people who have looked at a lot of art. And so therefore, you know, they have to be trusted to a certain extent. And, and I think, yes, I can imagine sort of science geeks who can do the programming and all that kind of thing going, but how do they tell what's good or not? Well, you, you wait, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, give it 30 years. <laughs> And they really don't know. And a lot of games started out with a technology person excited about the technology going, oh, I wonder if I can make it do this. And that is a perfectly reasonable place to start. But at a certain point, if you've got a lot of writing, you want to bring in someone who knows how to do the writing. And there are a lot of really quite successful games where I would point to the writing and go, this is terrible. And uh, the storytelling is not good and it's not well made and the characterization is not well made. And it's a, I would say it's catching up now, but it's almost as if for a long time, art galleries, the art on the walls were chosen by the builder who had built the building. And, <laughs> I like it. And, and like occasionally you might get someone there who really knows what they're doing and had built an art gallery building because they're very excited about that. Um, but there's been a lot of really shockingly bad storytelling. As a writer... There is also one technical problem with writing for games, which I find really interesting. And it's exciting to me to be working in a field where a lot of the hard problems haven't been solved yet. So... What are those hard problems? Well, here is a hard problem. You are playing a character in a video game. Is that character you? Or is that character a character like you'd see in a TV show? Right. Let's say you're playing James Bond for the yes. sake of it. That was a character that one frequently plays. Yes. So if you are actually James Bond, then you've got a lot of exciting possibilities for what can happen in your story. And you should know how to handle those because you're James Bond. Right, OK. So it's almost like, um, I mean, it's the same problem as immersive theatre and performance art, where you have to be able to guide your audience in such a way that they can have a good, interesting experience 
whilst also participating in the work. And this is one of the reasons that games tend to spend, well, big games tend to spend the first two or three hours teaching you how to play the game so that you can then have those experiences. It's as if we said to you, right, you're going to come to a piece of participatory theatre on Tuesday, therefore... You're going to spend your weekend learning how to be this character. (laughs) (laughs) In a way, it's kind of amazing that people are willing to spend the time. Well, that's an interesting reflection because often one of the arguments in defence of high culture is, oh, you need to learn about it. You you can't just walk into a classical concert or a Shakespeare play completely ignorant. You've got to kind of understand the context and the history and all this sort of thing before you can really enjoy it. So maybe... This is a you know a technical formalization of that process. I think so. I think what I'd say to people who say, "Oh, I'd really like to know about games." I say, "Okay, well, just tell yourself it's going to be like learning about opera from a standing start. It's going to be 15 or 20 hours before you actually get to the bit where you enjoy it." So, there certainly are fascinatingly weird experiences you can have in games that you can't have elsewhere. Mm. So, if what you want is to run over the rooftops of Renaissance Venice Mm -hmm. and drop down from a high roof and assassinate people, then you're not going to get that experience in real life. It's quite a fun little thing. It's it's one of my favourite games, Assassin's Creed, which is just there's a lot of climbing up buildings in Renaissance Italy and then jumping off them. And that's not something that I would do at any point in my life. It's sort of semi-buried in the sand, this building. Oh, I see. There's the mountain. We're going up the hill. I'm going... Well, do you want to try and see what's up here? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Depends how curious I am. No, I'm already... I've already been told... If I could have a look round... Go and look. Go and have a look. We're coming back down. Because this is not a game that is going to penalise you for anything. Oh, okay. So, go and have have a look at whatever that is. That looks like one of those Indian... um, Astronomy places a bit. Is what oh it's yes, the. Uh, that's what it looks like. Yeah, the, what is it called? The Janta Manta. Yeah, that's what it so looks go, like. So go and have a walk towards. Oh, that. I see. And it's got a Uniglo sign. And is it? A, is it in a branch of Uniglo? <laughs> Ah, oh, yes. yes. I need that fleece. So here you are. There's kind of things blowing about in the wind that look a bit like bits of ticker tapey film, and it's saying hold to the X. Okay, we're holding. Oh, I've started flying. This brings me to think about another aspect that I may struggle with with games is that I feel like I'm trapped in somebody else's imagination mm. and often it's like other people's dreams you know <laughs> actually it's like I, I, yeah I don't I, they don't really gel with me it, it, and it's, it's, there seems to be a sort of predilection in games aesthetic for kind of fantasy sword and sorcery steampunk all these kind of genres that make me you know that I cringe at them somehow because they're kind of cliches of the idea of imagination. Games have traditionally been fairly male. There have always been women playing games but and making games and, in, and enjoying games and talking about games. And certainly I've been playing games since I was seven years old, video games. But there is a hyper-masculine edge, a kind of cliched hyper-masculine edge to some of those big games. So there is a continuing debate, argument, conversation in games about why so few games have uh, you have the ability to play a female character. And, and, of course, people are starting to try and look like computer-animated people as well. And so you've got this sort of smoothness. And that's where, you know, that's where I kind of come out in hives, you know. <laughs> I can't bear it. It's just that awful, clichéd, masculine fear of expression, emotional expression. OK, well, I think we fully agree on the masculine fear of emotional expression. I find it a tragedy in the modern world. I think it's a tragedy for men, actually. And um, Tell I've... me about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's going to happen? We've got some smoke coming through. Yeah. Try walking more back towards where you were. See if that happens. Right. There we go. Is this having a religious experience? <laughs> I think the character is having a religious experience. Oh, okay. So in a way, where we are with games is sort of like, you know, Giotto standing there on the scaffold in Assisi saying, I think this genre has potential, perspective, I can really see it going somewhere. That is exactly where we are. We are at the very start. 
people only started making video games in about 1980 little bit earlier than that we are really you know when movies were this sort of age they had just started to experiment with sound so that's the point that we're at of people going i think there's a lot in here i think i've got a vision i think i could do something with this and i wouldn't i don't i don't say to anybody oh you must engage with this like i wouldn't say to anyone you must engage with opera you know if it doesn't do it for you it doesn't do it for you i'm not going to argue with that but I don't think there's anything intrinsic in the genre that means that it can't touch those deep experiences that we've talked about. Okay, so people have said for years, oh, but where is the game that will make you cry? Um, now I'm going to talk about my own work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I make a game. I'm the co-creator with a company called Six to Start of a game called Zombies Run. Right. Zombies Run. It is a fitness game, right. which you play by going for a run or for a walk in the real world. And we do stories in your headphones mm. from the zombie apocalypse to encourage you to go further and faster and make the whole business of getting some exercise a little bit less boring. There are tweets and emails and posts by people every day saying... I don't know how you expect me to keep running when I'm sobbing so hard. Oh, really? <laughs> I, I'm emotionally incredibly attached to these characters. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I, was, I, was, I, I thought I was just going out for a run this morning and my day is totally emotionally compromised by what has happened in the game. That's, you know, that's, that's a badge of pride for me. I think that, yeah, I'm convinced by you that there is potential where if we allow ourselves and, and the technology develops there will be great masterpieces and I think for me what they might have to do is stop calling them games <laughs> but actually you're not the only person to say that there are people who say well we can can we not call them interactive experiences can we not call them interactive digital art can mm. you know can we not find a different thing to call them and in fact there are reasons to say let's call some of these things games and some of these interactive fiction. Yeah, I think there might have to be a kind of piercing of the ways a bit around mm. that because language is very important. The word game is a big step that no amount of flying cape tickets is going to get me over. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, like, I don't know whether that might be, sorry, that might be a generational thing. It might be, or it might be that you're absolutely right. I love Revelation. That's what I came mm. to talk to you really mm. for was a little soupçon of revelation about the world of games because I'm suspicious of it but for me that's always a signal of oh here's a learning experience yeah. so yeah. it's been lovely actually well, have you had a soupçon of revelation I have had a soupçon of revelation and I hope the listener has too mm.